Welcome to this online lesson on the rise and fall of the open range, a continuation of the cattle industry. The aims are to know the reasons why the open range ended, to explain why multiple reasons ended the open range, and to use analysis to link those reasons together. We're also going to have the opportunity to study the cowboys for a bit as well, so that's how our starter is going to work. Have a look at the photograph of the cowboy. Study the clothes and equipment on the cowboy and identify the following items in the photograph. The cowboy's pistol, his rifle, which is in a dust cover. Leather chaps, these are the trouser covers that would protect the legs from things like uh, thistles and other um, and snakes and all sorts of nasty things you might find out on the plains. A very heavily worn saddle, possibly the most prized piece of equipment that the cowboy owned. A wide hat for both staying dry, protected from the wind and from protection from the sun. It's similar to the Stetson style. And a loose lasso. This is for uh, bringing in the cattle who might be wandering too far away. And lastly, the neckerchief, which would help protect the face from the dust that you'd get on the range. So once you've identified those different items, then choose any three items of equipment and explain how they might help the cowboy to do his job. You can pause the video now and press play when you're ready to continue. Okay, hopefully you found all of that uh, equipment in the photograph. Well, let's go through the uses. Well, the pistol, first of all, could be used for self-defense against people like rustlers and potentially uh, Native American attacks. The rifle similarly could be used for that, but is a longer ranged weapon. Um, this could also be used uh, to ward off things uh, like other animals that might attack the cattle. The leather chaps were all about protecting the legs from snakes and from sharp thorns and things that you would be riding through. The wide, uh, the worn saddle is well worn because the cowboy will be spending the vast majority of his time on the on the drive in the saddle. He would even sit uh, sleep in the saddle, so the saddle would be well worn and moulded to the cowboy's body. There was the wide hat as well, which provided protection from the sun, the rain, the wind, you name it. The lasso was useful for um, helping cattle which were stuck in bogs, but also helping bring them back into the herd if they were beginning to wander too, too far away. And the neckerchief helped protect the cowboy's face from dust and other nasty things like um, flies on the plains. It wasn't just for pulling over your nose and going and robbing banks like they te teach you in the Hollywood movies. And speaking of Hollywood movies, we're going to try and do a little bit of myth busting now. You're now going to do a research task on who were the cowboys. In the photographs, I've got a stereotypical Hollywood cowboy at the bottom. I mean, look at the state of that hat. And then we've got a real cowboy at the top. One difference you might notice is a racial difference. Yes, how many old cowboy films actually had a black man playing the cowboy? Very few. And yet being a cowboy was a popular job for many freed slaves. And so the truth of the matter is many cowboys were black. They were former slaves. So your task. You're going to create a description for each of the following based upon the information that can be found in the linked BBC Bite Size page. Firstly, a description of the long drive, the conditions on the drive, the equipment and jobs that they had to do, and, if there's anything there, some law and order in the railhead towns. After all, the cowboys would only be paid on arrival, and all of that money could go to their heads after many weeks in the saddle. Secondly, cowboys on the ranch, a very different lifestyle. What were their new jobs and roles in this uh, lifestyle? What was their lifestyle like? And did they have any seasonal jobs that were different? And lastly, who were the real cowboys? How was the real cowboy different to the Hollywood stereotype? It'll probably take you about half an hour to get that information together and make some relevant notes. So you can pause the video here and check out the link in the description. Thank you. And pause now. Okay, hopefully we've got the information that we need, and now we're going to look at the further development of the cattle industry and why the open range system died out. Key event. Add this as a new subheading. The winter of 1886-87, to 87, something that is known as the Great Die-Up. First of all, have a look at this painting. It is called Waiting for a Chinook. A Chinook is not a twin-rotored helicopter flown by the RAF. It is, in fact, a warm northerly wind, which often signalled the, the arrival of spring on the plains. You can see that wolves are circling an emaciated and starving cow. But why is that cow in such bad shape? Well, the fact of the matter is, the snow and ice is so thick that the cow can't reach the grass, and so is left to wander around hopelessly looking for little tufts of grass that might be uh, just pointing through the snow. 
In 1886, there was an incredibly cold and harsh winter. The cattle couldn't find grass through the thick snow, and at least 15% of all the cows starved to death. Those that were left were skinny and weak, and so they fetched lower prices at market. After all, they were being um, bought for their beef, and without much muscle, there wasn't much beef. This put lots of ranches using the open range system out of business, and it became known as the Great Die-Up. First of all then, explain why bad weather led to ranches going out of business. And then second of all, what is meant by the term Great Die-Up. Pause the video now and complete the tasks. Alright, so hopefully we've been able to link the bad weather to the cows not being able to find the grass to eat, to them then fe uh, fetching lower prices at market, and then the ranches themselves losing money. So what is meant by the term great die-up? Well, you might be familiar with the cowboys process of rounding up the cattle each season. Well, this wasn't so much as a round-up as a die-up, as so many of the cattle were found either dead or near death. This is a picture of a moo cow. Did you enjoy that? Good, we'll move on. I'm now going to show you the development of the cattle industry from the start, right the way through to the end of our, our time period. We're going to start with the 1861 Civil War. This disrupted the Texas cattle industry and herds multiplied and got tougher. In 1865, Texans established trails to the new railhead towns. This would allow the cattle to be sold further afield. Then in 1866, the Goodnight Loving Trial supply, Trail rather, supplied army forts and Indian reservations to the north. In 1867, Joseph McCoy established the first cow town at Abilene. Buyers met cattle sellers at stockyards by the railroad. Then in 1868, Fort, the Fort Laramie Treaty, this is the second Fort Laramie Treaty, banned white Americans from entering Indian lands. This meant that the cattle drives now needed to pay the Indians to use their land, and so their profits were lower. In the 1860s, homesteader farmers, fearing cattle diseases, began blocking the cattle drives. That's another impact, uh, negative impact on the industry. Then the 1870s, ranching and the open range began with John Eilith in Wyoming. This idea spread rapidly. In 1874, barbed wire fences closed off the open range. This led to further conflict with homesteaders. In 1875, refrigerated railroad cars developed. These were called boxcars. Uh, these allowed ranched beef to be basically killed on site and then taken and sold further away without it going off. Then, 1876, the cattle industry was booming. Investors rushed to back ranching. The cattle barons seized control. This is part of the beef bonanza of the 1870s. Then, 1886 to 1887, we've got the Great Die-Up. A harsh winter starved the cattle. Those cattle that survived were sold cheaply, as they were skinny and sick. And that's the end. Here's what you're going to do with those events. You're going to select between three and five of those events that can be linked together and note them down. And do note them down in chronological order. Based on this information and the work we've done in previous lessons or your further reading, do you think that the winter of 1886 to 87 caused the end of the open range or was it about to end anyway? Whatever your opinion, explain your point of view. So you can pause the video now and you can complete those tasks. And by the way, I would not be at all against the idea of creating your own diagram similar to this, because these will con constitute excellent revision notes for you to refer, refer to again. So pause the video now. Hopefully you've chosen your events, just make sure that they're in chronological order now. So do you think that the 1886 to 87 Great Die-Up was what finished off the open range? Well, it possibly accelerated the process, but I do need to draw your attention to the uh, earlier factors from the 1860s and 1870s that were already putting pressure on the continued survival of the open range, in particular relationships with homesteaders and extra government um, uh, or extra rules by the government, which meant that they had to cooperate with and pay the Indians for the use of the land. So it's difficult to say, but I don't know, I sort of edge on the, the side that the, the open range would have ended one way or another anyway, especially as homesteading grew and grew. We're now going to put this to use then in a narrative account style question. There's another picture of a big old moor. You may also use the following in your answer. The Great Die-Up of 1886-7 and John Eilif. You must also use information of your own. Remember with these questions how you answer them. 
First of all, these bits of stimulus material you may use, and indeed it is a good idea to use them because you know that they're going to be relevant. However, you don't have to. What you absolutely do need to do though is include information of your own. So you're going to write a narrative account. Oh, I've just noticed the pun I've done there. I'm not even sorry. A narrative account analysing the development of the cattle industry. Remember, a narrative account is telling a story. But it's not just telling a story, you also need to explain the links. Think of a narrator like what I'm doing. You're telling a story. But I'm explaining the links between these different things too. So a narrative account analysing the development of the cattle industry is explaining how it developed and how the events within it link together. Here's how you answer it. A narrative account is basically telling a story, but your story must be based upon real events and explain how and why they happened. With a story, it's important to get the events in the right order. That's why in the previous tasks, I ask you to write them in chronological order, and you can use that timeline that you produced to help you. Then you use these phrases in your answer. This led to, as a result, this caused, and consequently. And then you sum up the overall theme of change at a basic conclusion, or you can explain which the most important change was. E.g., what was that most important development? So it should take you about ooh, somewhere between 12 and 15 minutes to answer this question. Give it some real thought and then we'll have a look at an example answer. Good luck. Pause the video now. Let's have a look at an example answer then. Write a narrative account analysing the development of the cattle industry in the years 1861 to 87. What I've done here is I've put my points in red, my examples in green, and my explanations and further bits of information in blue. I've put the links, which are the most important bits because these are the analysis and link back to the question, in purple. After the end of the Civil War in 1866, the number of cattle had grown in Texas to the extent that they needed to be sold elsewhere to make a good profit. This led to the beginning of the Texas cattle drives, where cowboys were, were to drive cattle to the railhead towns. As a result of this, Joseph McCoy established Abilene. Notice in bold I've put the linking sentence, as a result of this. This shows that I'm, um, I'm showing that this event is a lead on from the last one. So, as a result of this, Joseph McCoy established Abilene. This was a cow town that began sending trainloads of cattle to cities in 1867. Cattle that would have been worth $5 in Texas could be sold for $40 in Chicago. Again, this is my own knowledge, and so I'll be getting extra credit for this. There is four marks for your own knowledge and four marks for your analysis in these questions. This helped to develop the cattle industry as it showed that huge amounts of money could be made from driving cattle to purpose-built railhead towns where the cattle could be taken to be sold for big profits in the cities. However, that's another linking, the driving of cattle across the plains was not without obstacles. This led to more linking words, the increasing tensions with homesteaders. In 1874, barbed wire was invented. Homesteaders could use barbed wire to fence off their land and protect their crops. Previously, the, on the open range, cattle were free to roam. This developed the cattle industry as there was a move towards ranching of cattle rather than letting them roam freely on the, pu on the public open range land. This led to the decline of the open range system. But the most important development was the Great Die-Up of 1886. Here's where I'm concluding. The numbers of cattle that starved or were too sick to make much money meant that cattle grazing on the open range stopped being profitable. This developed the cattle industry because the ranchers who could feed their cattle were able to survive. And remember, they were typically the smaller ranchers. Uh, and they were able to survive the, harsh, the effects of the harsh winter better and continue to make money. And there we have it. Plenty of my own knowledge. I've used all the examples of the stimulus material. And with those purple bits, I've really linked it back to the uh, development of the cattle industry. And check out as well the fact that I've been able to have this as a logical process in chronological order, going from 1866, 1867, 1874, and then concluding in 1886 to 87. A narrative account. Well, I'm sure you found that incredibly moving, and on that terrible joke, we'll end the lesson. I'd like to apologise for any offence that my cow jokes have caused. You may well be sitting there and thinking, how dare he? Okay, I promise that's the last one. Anyway, if you liked the video, if you found it useful, press, uh, press the like button and subscribe to the channel now. Thanks and goodbye.